Hey guys, it's Sarah from Sweet Sense from the Dollhouse. If you're new to my channel, be sure to subscribe and hang out. Last week I took a break from Most Requested Monday. Um, just life has been way, way, way too busy. And admittedly, the topic that I'm about to discuss turned out to be a little bit more difficult than I thought. Um, there's times where I could just like openly ramble and tell you so many facts and this and that and this and that and be so sure of myself and my convictions and in my experiences and and be able to share those things with you confidently. And then there's other times where I just shut down um, when I have to talk about something that has affected my life greatly, like immensely. Um, I have clinical obsessive compulsive disorder. I know I've said it on my channel before. Um, in this society, in this day and age, we know what is appropriate and what is not. We know using the R word is unacceptable. We know using racial slurs is unacceptable. Um, attacking people or making mention of people's sexuality, their um, gender identification, you name it. There's a million things that we are learning in this day and age to be appropriate topic content or appropriate terminology versus inappropriate. And I'm really, really, really hoping the next handle we get is on mental illness. I consistently, constantly, everywhere, whether it's online or in person or whatever, see people talking about, you know, keeping their house tidy or they keep their car clean or I like things just so because I'm so OCD. I think... It's very important that people recognize that obsessive compulsive disorder is a serious medical condition. It, just because you keep your car nice doesn't mean you're so OCD. It just means that y you are a tidy individual and you take pride in your belongings. That, that doesn't equate to you having a serious medical condition. And I think people need to realize that OCD or living a life with obsessive compulsive disorder is so much more than hand washing and checking that your doors are locked. Um, those are definitely common signs and symptoms, keeping things tidy, but unless you have lived with OCD or know somebody who has like a clinical case, a medical condition of OCD, you have no idea how debilitating this condition can be. It might start as something simple as hand washing or counting. Um, and that's just one teeny tiny part of your life, but it tends to spread like wildfire into other aspects of your life. I don't even know where to start. I guess now looking back, I believe that I've always had obsessive compulsive disorder. It didn't really rear its ugly head until well into my teens. But now looking back, um, we've all played that game when we were little. Don't step on the crack or you'll break your mom's back. I did that all the time. I knew how many steps it took between my house and my school. And I would walk today, or I would walk to school every day, ritualistically counting. And I was four years older than my younger brother, so I was also in charge of getting his sorry ass to school with me, and he'd be screwing around, and I would lose count. And a normal person would be like, hey, come on, Derek, let's go. Like, we're gonna be late. No, I would lose count, and like, I can't even describe the feeling just this total feeling of fear you know that that feeling in your chest when you're terrified I would lose count of my steps because my brother was dicking around and all of a sudden in my mind something bad was going to happen to a normal person you're like that that's doesn't even make sense that's not even realistic the steps steps counting steps has anything to do with a premonition of things to come like that to 
a normal individual, that doesn't make sense. It's, it's not logical. But to a person with obsessive compulsive disorder, it it's very real. Even though it doesn't make sense, the feeling, the intensity is totally real. So I would do things like the hand washing or the counting or the this and the that. And those things, you obsess on them. And while you're busy obsessing on these things that really, in reality, don't matter, the rest of your life is falling apart. And I did this even as a child. So I would be obsessing over color coordinating my pencils and this, that, the other thing, and not doing the homework assignment or not finishing the project. And then leave myself a window this big, have to cram, cram, cram to meet school deadlines or anything. And again, in my mind, if I don't get this in on time, if I don't make the grade, if I don't make the team, my parents are going to die in a car accident. And again, realistically, logically, what does my homework assignment have to do with the probability of my parents getting in a car accident? Doesn't make sense. But these are things as a child that played over and over and over in my mind. Looking back now, I, for a long time, thought that I was triggered or something must have happened in my teens that I developed OCD all of a sudden. But now as an adult, looking back and remembering, um, I've always had it. One in a hundred children have OCD. Um, there's research showing that it could be genetic, so it's caused at birth environmental effects, um, has a lot to do with the development of your brain, um, the serotonin levels, like there's a lot of scientific research happening as to why OCD is, I guess it's, it's not common, but it's not uncommon, if that makes sense. And I think a lot of people live with OCD and they don't even realize that they have it or that they're displaying traits of OCD. So... I lived like that my entire childhood, and I don't know. Maybe it was that game of don't step on your mom's, don't step on the crack or you'll break your mother's back, that I just, I didn't verbalize my fear. I didn't verbalize my distress because I guess perhaps the logical side of my brain said, Sarah, this isn't real. I, I always have this inner fight, you know, I, I, even now as a 35 year old grown adult, I could be totally engaged in an OCD, OCD ritualistic behavior. And I have the logical side of my brain saying, Sarah, snap the fuck out of this. Like you're being ridiculous. You've got this, get a handle on it. Just stop. That too has been one of my biggest triggers for emotional breakdowns is when people tell me to just stop or change it. When somebody has a true medical condition or a real legit mood and anxiety disorder, mental illness, even depression, you cannot tell somebody to just snap out of it or just stop. Clearly, if it was within our physical power to stop these ritualistic behaviors or to stop, prevent this line of thinking, we would. Nobody chooses to live like this. It's beyond our control. So Tatum, I was pregnant at 16. I gave birth when Tatum was 17 here in Ontario. Um, I'm not sure how it is today, but 18 years ago when I gave birth to a baby, as a baby, um, children's services needed to check in. And I get it, obviously, babies having babies, someone should be checking in on babies having babies. In my circumstance, I, I worked full time, I went to school full time, I was living at home with my parents, there was nothing that I could have needed, wanted for that child, you name it, I had all my bases covered, but Children's Aid had to check in with me just to be sure. This spawned some intense Hello. fear for me. Hello. Hi, babe. Is that yeah, it's a meow meow. Okay. 
This inspired some intense fear for me because as a young child, basically, not even... Hi, Mimi! Hi, Mimi! Not even yet 18, to me, Children's Aid represented the enemy. You got cows? Yeah! You know, and I thought... Children's Aids is going to check in on me and they're going to, you know, think that I'm a poor mom. And I've just, it just, my anxiety went through the roof. As a teen mom, perhaps it too was all in my head, but I just felt like people thought that I was destined for failure. I felt like every day I had to wake up and prove myself worthy prove myself worthy of the title of motherhood, even though I brought that baby into the world, I nursed her, I cared for her just as much as a full-grown adult would have, you know, I don't, even, even now after having three kids, I can verifiably say nobody is ever ready to have a fucking baby, <laughs> let's just put that out there right now, I don't care how much you plan, I don't care how much money you have, I don't care how much you saved, I don't care. Nobody is ready for that little bundle of crying shit show to pop into your world and rock your shit. Nobody's ever ready for that, right? But I felt when I was younger that I had to be on point. I had to be on my A game. I had to bring it because I felt like everybody was judging me. So the first two years of Tatum's life... Um, I documented all the milestones, don't get me wrong. She has a baby book where this is the day she pooped on the potty and this is the day she took her first steps and whatever it was. But I was obsessing over being the best mom I could be because I felt like I was under a microscope. Even though that initial check-in with Children's Aid, they basically walked into my hospital room, says, do you have a job? Do you need social services? Do you need a crib? Do you need this? Do you need that? And I was like, no, 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 no. I got everything. Where do you plan on living? I'm going to pay rent at my parents' house until I can get my own place. Check, check, check. Congratulations. Have a nice day. Like, they were in and out of my room in 2.2 seconds. I was cleared to go home. But that feeling of being under a microscope in the first two years of Tatum's life never went away. I was consumed with being the best mom and proving myself worthy of the title of motherhood. Um, she was about three when I talked about the visions for the first time. Now looking back, I know that this is a common side effect of OCD. But imagine being a 17-year-old, having a baby, the first three years that little shit show rocks my world, Proving myself on top of working full-time and finishing high school to, again, prove myself. And then add the most violent and disturbing images and fears to that for those first three years while I was so busy balancing and doing this juggling act and, and proving to everybody that I was perfect and that I had my shit together and I could handle this, that I wasn't over my head. I was also having graphic images of something bad happening to my daughter. And the best way that I have described it to people before is imagine you're watching a movie inside your head. But imagine you have no control. Doesn't matter how hard you think that you want to see a rom-com or, you know, Seth Rogen or something, you know, ridiculous, funny, light, stupid, whatever. You see violent, disturbing, horrific things happening to your children in the form of a movie inside your head. You have no control when these violent images are going to pop into your head. You have no way of stopping them. For example, uh, we moved into a condo. It was a 10th floor condo. Um, I, I made sure there was no balcony. I wanted, a, I, I wanted this 
really nice condo in the north end of London, <clears throat> but couldn't have a balcony. Could not. Could not have a balcony. And I thought I was safeguarding myself by not having a balcony because that's one less thing that I have to worry about with a three-year-old, right? Instead, we had these like beautiful um, floor-to-ceiling windows. Like the whole one side of my condo was all beautiful windows. And imagine living there every day and any time, even getting a, a glimpse out of the corner of my eye of those windows, I would not only envision Tatum falling out of that window, even though these fucking windows didn't even open. I don't know how, but I would envision her falling and I would envision what her body, her little three-year-old body would look like when it hit the ground. And these visions played over and over and over in my mind. I couldn't take my daughter for a walk without being manic. Hold my hand! Stand on the inside! Stop moving! Don't run! Don't play! Don't skip! Don't do anything because you're going to get hit by a fucking car! And there's this three-year-old little baby who just wants to chase a fucking butterfly or stop on the boulevard and smell a dandelion. And mom is level 12 raging. What's going on? This isn't normal, but because I was 17, 18, 19 years old trying to prove that I was perfect and that I had my shit together and I didn't need help and I could do this and I was just as prepared or just as capable as a full-grown woman to have a baby, I said nothing about this for three years. Finally, I came to a head when my three-year-old, and Tatum has always been wise beyond her years. She is just an old soul. I've, I've always known it. She, she would grab my hand and comfort me or say to me, mommy, all the other kids are playing. Can I please play? Mommy, please let go of me. Mommy, I promise I will watch. I will be careful. I won't go any more steps further. Just please let me play with the other kids. And that to be rocked into reality by um, the physical touch and the reassurance coming from a three-year-old because the three-year-old knew that our version of reality wasn't normal is what um, finally snapped me out of it and and finally <sighs> encouraged me to ask for help. So I went to my general practitioner and I'm not making this video to say second guess doctors or don't trust your he trusted healthcare professionals. I'm not saying this at all, but I had a horrible family doctor at the time. I didn't know he had been my family doctor since I was nine years old. So I had full reason to trust him and believe in him, I went to him and said, Dr. Talon, this is what's happening, and I know it's not normal. I need your help. Um, I was misdiagnosed, <laughs> like so horribly misdiagnosed by a general practitioner, okay? I don't know how it is anywhere else, but here in Canada, you do your four-year undergrad, and then you go to medical school. You do four years in med school. Don't get me wrong. You're a doctor. You are. But you don't specialize. You're not a fucking psychiatrist. Who the hell was my general practitioner to diagnose me with postpartum depression? My child was three. Okay? <laughs> I'm not saying that I'm a doctor by any means. But again... 19 turning 20, he's the trusted professional in the room. I obviously trust what he says. Okay, so I do my homework and I take my medicine and it's not going away. You can't put somebody with obsessive compulsive disorder on Paxil and hope that the behaviors and the images and the violent things are going to stop. Paxil did nothing to me other than make me feel like a zombie. I couldn't cry when I was upset. I couldn't be elated and happy when I had a reason to get excited. 
you know, I couldn't have an orgasm. I just felt like a walking fucking turd. And I was still having these violent images or terrible, terrible, terrible feelings like, um, you know, if, if I don't do this or if I don't make this much money, if I don't do this, then something bad's going to happen to Tatum. Play violent image of her falling out of a 10-story balcony. This, that, the other thing. Like, it was just a fucking gong show. But I trusted my general practitioner. I did what I was supposed to do. Um, my husband and I built our, our first actual house. We moved there, which I felt better. But, like, that's the thing. is It, it never goes away. It just changes into something else. We built a house near a train track. There was a train wall. It was a far distance. It was safe. But one irrational fear develops into a new irrational fear. You can take me out of one environment, but I take the behaviors and the bullshit to a new environment and find something new to be terrified of, right? So now we have two children. Uh, Grace is wee small. The girls are four years apart. So I remember this like it was yesterday. Um, we took, just my husband and I, we didn't take Tatum with us, but we took the tour with the principal of her school. This is supposed to be a very exciting time in Tatum's life. And imagine my daughter, who has been smothered by me for four years. If she wasn't under my direct thumb at all times, she was with my grandmother while I was at work. That's another thing. Trust no one to watch my kids ever, ever, other than maybe, maybe three people, maybe, you know, three more than capable people, but I would still obsess and worry or whatever. So Tatum's been under my rule and my thumb with severe, untreated, un properly diagnosed OCD for four years. She is, again, wise beyond her years, more than ready to get the hell away from my psychoness and get out to school and have a normal life with the rest of these kids. She's so excited. She's got her backpack. I'm so ready, mommy, and I'm going to be the best when I go to school, and I promise you I'll be good, and I'll watch, and I won't cross the road without you, and I'll just, I'll stay in the playground, and mom, you don't have to worry about me. So my husband and I go for the tour, and I'm looking around, and I'm like, yeah, this is, this is great. This is going to be so awesome for Tatum. This is going to be amazing. She's really going to flourish here, and I'm okay with this. You know, this is what normal people do. Normal people send their kids to fucking school. We get to the part of the tour and the school where he shows us the bathrooms. Not a good time for Sarah to have an epic mental breakdown in front of my daughter's soon-to-be principal. He showed us the bathrooms. And I said to him, mm, Tatum's going to use the girls' bathroom? Yes. By herself. Well, with other children, she can ask to go to the bathroom during school time, and she's given a hall pass, and she'll go. The teacher will know that she's in there, but she has to return to her classroom with the hall pass. Like, just common sense, normal knowledge. I know. I went to school. I know how it fucking works, right? But to my illogical way of thinking, I jump to she's going to be alone in a restroom where someone can hurt her, molest her, kill her, drown her in a toilet, whatever. Full mental breakdown right in the middle of the hallway, right in front of the fucking principal. My husband, who is a fucking asshole now, but at the time, thank goodness for him, he said, can you please excuse us for a second? Pulls me to the side and he's like, Sarah, you have really got to get some help. Like, I can deal with this. I signed up for this. I love you. I married you knowing full well what I was getting into because it is not easy. It is, I'll give him that. 
You know, our marriage wasn't perfect. He wasn't perfect. But it is not easy to have to deal with somebody with OCD who needs constant reassurance, who needs a constant reality check. Like, he said to me, I love you, and I signed up for this, and I will go through thick and thin to hell and back with you. But for the sake of our kids, you need some help. You need a real doctor. You need a psychiatrist, Sarah. Please don't do this here. As soon as we get out of here, melt down all you want. But don't take your shit to Tatum's new school. So we rejoined the principal and I said, because I wasn't quite out of my state yet, is there any way she can use the staff bathroom? <laughs> yeah. For her whole school career, she's going to go and use the staff bathroom because her mom at the time was undiagnosed, unmedicated, mentally ill. <laughs> yeah. Where do I sign for that? <laughs> staff bathroom privileges. But I can laugh about it now, but at the time, it, the, the feeling, the overwhelming feeling, these things feel real to somebody, even though it's totally unlogical, it doesn't make sense, it's not even, it, it's, to a normal person, this all sounds fucking stupid, uh, surely to you it must sound stupid, but you don't understand until you live it how real these imaginary threats seem. And to a certain to a certain degree, there's always threats as a parent. Like e even somebody who isn't medically ill, of course you always have to be proactive in keeping your children safe and so on and so forth. But mine was like to the fucking 12th degree, way out, far in left field. It, it was smothering to my children. There's a difference between safeguarding your children and smothering your children. And my love was the smothering kind of love. Even now, my daughter is 18 years old, and I now, knowing my condition, knowing how to best cope, even now I have to catch myself and step back a bit. She's an 18-year-old woman, you know? I'm so proud of myself. This weekend, she's at a music festival in Guelph. I didn't call her 10,000 times. I was until she reached out to me. You know? Now, I believe I can. I really have to keep myself in check because she's an adult. She doesn't have to choose to have my smothering love in her life anymore. She had an entire life, childhood of, of me smothering her. She, she doesn't need that anymore. She needs me to be healthy. She needs me to be able to give her the space to grow to fall on her face if need be. She just needs me there to be her mom, to pick her up and brush her off. She doesn't need me smothering her anymore. So those are lessons that, I, that I've learned and I've, I've really had to uh, deal with. I mean, that is like the worst, the worst of the worst for me, thankfully. And I know a lot of people a lot of people with my same condition have, have it way worse off than I do. Um, but in my life, I think that affecting my children has been the most damaging aspect, right? Like, there is times when I feel overwhelmed that I develop bouts of agoraphobia, where I won't leave my house. And again, to a rational thinking person, it doesn't make sense. What are you afraid of? But in my mind, I think if I don't leave my house, nothing bad can happen to me. If I don't do social media, I won't see the bad things that are happening in the world. I won't replay these images of, God forbid, what the fuck Trump is going to get his country into and, and worry about my friends and my family in the States and, you know, all of these things that consume me. I avoid them. But I also look back on it subjectively once the mania has ended. And I'm like, 
yes, I'm avoiding those images and those thoughts and those fears, but at the same time, in order to avoid them, I am retreating into my own little world, not leaving my house. I am terrified to walk down the street, and it's literally one, two houses, like not even a full block down the street, to get my fucking mail out of the mailbox. What? What bad things can happen to me by walking 75 feet that way and opening a mailbox? Right now, I'll tell you, that doesn't make sense. It's not fucking logical. It's, it's silly. But when somebody is in a manic state and is in a full-blown episode, don't you dare tell them that it's silly, it's irrational, or it's not real. Don't tell them to change it. Don't tell them to stop. I love my mom to pieces, but when I would get worked up or replaying these vivid images or trying to confide in my mom saying, you know, mom, it's like watching a movie, but I have no control over what I watch. To a normal person, the answer seems clear. Just stop. Sarah, just stop doing that to yourself. And I tried to tell my mom, Mom, it's not that easy. If it was that easy, clearly I would. Nobody would choose to live like this. I remember, and this is how I best explained it to her. <clears throat> when I was little, we were driving on our way to a doctor's appointment and uh, there was these high school kids playing chicken with the train. All of a sudden we see a backpack fly up in the air. The kid was cut into 10 million pieces because he was hit by the train and I remember hearing the train blowing its horn. I remember that. I remember not once, not twice, not three times, four times that train was laying on the horn, laying on the horn, laying on the horn, and the backpack still flew up in the air, and the train kept moving. And I remember laying in bed saying to my mom as a child, Mom, why didn't the train stop? Obviously, at six or seven years old, not understanding the laws of physics, and the train's too fucking heavy to stop on a dime, I now have used the same analogy, analogy of explaining it to my mom. It's kind of like why that train didn't stop, mom. The train, the conductor, would have, if he could have, if I could stop and change the outcome or stop and change the mania or stop doing what I'm doing and smothering my kids or... Spending six weeks at a time terrified to leave the house, if I could just stop on a dime, I would. Because no one would sign up for this voluntarily. Right? Um, mood and anxiety disorders are very common, and this video I have filmed, probably I have filmed this most requested video the most out of all videos that I filmed and had to re-record because I screwed up or whatever, at first, I just gave you cold, hard facts about what OCD is. Well, that's not really what was requested of me. My subscriber wanted to hear more about my journey or my life with OCD, mood and anxiety disorders. So, rambling off a bunch of facts, if you wanted to know that, you can find that shit on Google. But, again, I reiterate, this is my experience. These have been my struggles, and no person or persons with OCD, my struggles with OCD aren't going to be identical to a counterpart person who has OCD. They will have their own hang-ups and their own ritualistic behaviors. It, we might all suffer from the same medical condition, but it manifests in various different ways and is debilitating to different people in different ways, right? A lot of people 
go on to lead very full lives, whether they're medicated or unmedicated. And please, don't get me wrong. I'm not making this video for a pity party or asking people to feel sorry for me or coming at you like, oh, poor me, because I have, despite my condition, lived a very full life. Considering there's times where I do suffer from bouts of agoraphobia, I forced myself out of that zone by getting a job that I had to travel. If I wanted money to pay my mortgage and keep my fucking lights on, you best believe you're getting your bags packed and you're getting on that fucking airplane, Sarah. I might have to take a handful of lorazepam to get on the plane and actually go, but I did it. And I spent a great deal of time traveling for work, stepping out of that comfort zone and saying, fuck you, OCD, you don't own me. You're not going to take over the rest of my life. Just not. And I've also realized the older the children get, you know, when they're young, they're so cute and you think you're going to have these kids forever. And I also have seen tons of people um, fight over kids, you know, when they get divorced. And, and I try and tell my friends who use the term, you know, we're in court and I'm going to win or this, that, the other thing. There's, there's no fucking winning or losing when it comes to family court. And you don't own your children. We are granted this amazing job and opportunity to take care of them for a very short time. My children are not permanent fixtures in my life. Well, I take that back. They are definitely permanent fixtures in my life. They're always going to be my blood, my children, but they don't belong to me. I don't own these children and I'm only responsible for them for a very short period of their life. Now that my children are growing and they are moving on, you know, I, I have Ella now. I was aiming for freedom 35. <laughs> Tatum's 18 and Grace is 14 this year. I was planning on starting a nudist colony in Thailand, but I had Ella instead, you know. Um, <clears throat> our children grow up and they leave us. And I have to think, if... If I have spent a great deal of my time obsessing over keeping my children safe and safeguarding my children and trying to micromanage every single minute of their life, and in the last six or seven years, I think I've taken a huge step back and gone, holy fuck, Sarah, what will you do when they're not here anymore? What will you do when you don't have the children to obsess over and worry about all the time. Almost scary because with the OCD, it's very unknown. Like I said, you can take me out of one environment. I can, you know, one obsession can be removed, but it's always replaced with something different. OCD is not a curable condition. So it's, the unknown is scary as fuck. If I don't have my kids to obsess over anymore, it's scary what I might get into. Hopefully it's just wax, you know? <laughs> that would be fucking amazing. I'll sit here all day and obsess and, and micromanage my wax collection. Fine. But I need a life. My children need a life. I cannot let OCD run my shit show. I can't. I have to be the leader of this pack. I have to constantly remind myself and get myself in check, get my emotions in order. And now I talk myself through things. I also, I can't even remember where I read this or where I heard this to schedule your reactions. And this is good for everybody, not just for people with um, medical conditions or mental illness. This is good for anyone. Schedule your reactions. So I started doing this about four years ago now because I'm a numbers girl. Obviously, I have OCD. Everything's in threes and fives, and aesthetically, threes and fives are just better. Come on. <laughs> but um, 
I give myself three minutes, three hours, or three days before I react to something. I think, and every circumstance is different, you know what I mean? Obviously, if something is urgent and pressing, it's going to be three minutes. I take a breather, sit back and think about it. I go through my line of questions to myself. Sarah, is this logical? Sarah, have you thought of this from the other person's perspective? You know, because there's always two sides to every story and the truth always lays somewhere in the middle or when, you know, you're in a conflict or something, you have to try and be open to their thoughts, their opinions versus just lashing out and reacting, right? So sometimes I prefer if I can schedule a longer reaction, you know, give myself some time to chill out, cool down, think logically about a situation before I respond or before I react. And again, as I say, whether you have mental illness or not, just as a general rule, if you wait three hours, three minutes, or three days, whatever the situation allots, you are going to get a much more logical, level-headed, and empathetic response from a person who has seriously considered before they open their mouth. I find that that's a, that's a problem in our day and age in our society. We have that instant gratification at the same time. A lot of people fucking talk before they think, right? And I think if the world scheduled our reactions and our responses to one another, we would have a lot more of a peaceful existence, right? So I'm not sure if this video has met the requirements of me sharing my experience or my condition with you. Um, I am to this day unmedicated. Do I think that I have more frequent issues with OCD? No. I think that they're going to be there whether I'm medicated or not. I just, to me, I feel OCD is a very small part of my life. Yes, it's, it's an everyday thing that I have to deal with, but it's a very small part of my life. And for, I'd say, you know, the vast majority of my day, I'm busy living life and I'm not letting OCD get the best of me. So I, I, I choose not to be medicated. I choose to schedule my reactions, ask myself a list of questions before I respond, before I react. I talk myself out of ritualistic behaviors. And again, everybody's experience is their own. Some people have OCD by far, 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 far worse than I do. So perhaps they can't be as successful at self-talk. Perhaps they rely on those medicines to have a more normal existence, right? And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that either. You need to do what you need to do. I hope that by sharing my experience with you, it will help people think maybe the next time before you say something so silly as, oh, I'm so OCD, keeping your car clean and envisioning what your child would look like if they were hit by a train, not the same. Not the same. Keeping your space tidy is not the same as some people replay pornographic images in their mind over and over and over. Some people almost suffer like Tourette's like um, impulses about screaming foul language and appropriate things in, in situations that don't you know, just out of the blue, almost like Tourette's. People with OCD have symptomatic impulses, almost like Tourette's. Not the same as keeping your car clean. You know, I, I best describe OCD as a life with organized a, a life of organized chaos. So this is my best example. I have probably about 
8,000 photographs because I like hard copies of everything. I might decide to organize them by month. I might decide to organize them chronologically, but I will cover my entire house with photographs. And that's all I do. And until those are organized the way I want them, does that mean my house is clean? Fuck no. <laughs> Well, I'm organizing my pictures in a manic OCD state, the rest of the house is falling to shit. The laundry is piling up. The dishes are overflowing. Like, OCD is a life of organized chaos. It has nothing to do with just being a tidy person. So I hope that making this video, I... I make people think before you say, oh, I'm so ECD, like it's a clicky fucking trendy thing to be, because it's not. I also hope by making this video that if you are suffering from signs or any of the symptoms that I have discussed on my channel and you feel all consumed, reach out to somebody. Learn from my mistakes. Don't suffocate your children. Don't go three years in fear and not saying anything, speak out. Also, never, ever, ever be scared to ask questions. Trust your medical professionals, but to a degree. Ask questions and ask for a second opinion because I wish at the, you know, ages 17, 18, 19, I had a said, fuck you, GP, you're a quack. Get me in to see a psychiatrist because that general practitioner played with medicine, put me on a whole bunch of nonsense that does nothing for OCD. It's not even medicine for OCD. I was just his fucking pharmaceutical guinea pig. See a specialist. I don't believe that general practitioners have any business playing with people's heads talk to someone, reach out, comment down below. I would be happy to help if I can. <laughs> Again, I am by no means a specialist or a medical professional. I am just simply sharing my experience with you for most requested Monday. I apologize it took so long to make this video. I hope this is the last time I record it, but <sighs> It's just such a tricky subject for me to discuss and it, there's so many layers to a medical condition like this. I could, I could literally talk for hours about this and give you different scenarios and different experiences and different, you know, examples. But I hope this helps clarify or I hope this speaks to someone if you're suffering alone, know that you don't have to. Comment down below, what would you like to see for next week's most requested Monday? Any topic within reason. Obviously, if I talked about this, the sky's the limit. So thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in my next video.